Hi, I'm Mark. Met some of you earlier. So you are the gluttons for punishment. You have come back for another session with the ranting and raving guy. Um, so the way we planned this was to talk a little more about implementation. I sort of, I hope I painted a picture. I chatted with a lot of you in the in, in between time, and I think a lot of folks said to me, good connection. This is great to see how our work fits into this bigger picture. And I had a number of people say to me, just the right time for Sullivan County. You know, that our region is at a moment. I see another nodding head. Any number of people said, you know, we're really ready for this conversation. People have been doing good work in bits and pieces. We need this sort of unified effort. I sat in on both of the sessions for a little while, and I've got to tell you, um, from the sort of mechanics of curb appeal right on up to some of the policy level stuff that was being talked about in there, really encouraging for me. And it really is a good example of up and down my pyramid, right? Stuff that's very much about sort of programmatic change, but right on down to policies like land banking and uh, updating your zoning ordinance and you know reducing variances and things. Really, really interesting. So you are, you're at the moment. So I'm gonna talk about sort of 10-ish ideas to sort of get us moving forward. By the way, so very excited to see Monte Monticello did manage to preserve the Mickey Mouse clock. I understand that was a big deal. Kudos to you guys, well done. The other piece, by the way, smaller group, I do, I'm happy to have you. I mean, you guys sitting in back, it's the classic sitting in the back of church so you can sneak out right out. That's fine if you want to, but I invite discussion, questions, you can interrupt me. The, you know, earlier I was sort of just plowing through, but I'm happy to sort of uh, take, the, take the tangents and the, uh, the, uh, the side tracks here. Having said that, I'm going to remind you that I earlier, so 10-ish ideas on concrete action. So if you were at all enthused about what I said earlier, but now you're saying, okay, literally, what do I do tomorrow? What might I go do? That's what these 10-ish ideas will be. I'll try to get there. Uh, having said that, you'll remember that paper that I wrote really talked about five broad areas, which are about smarter land use decisions, around treating our streets differently, not just as corridors to move cars, but as places for people. In fact, there's an entire movement out there, some of you may be very familiar, called placemaking. Maybe you were here when Fred Kent or the folks from Project for Public Spaces was in the area, that they talk about placemaking and the necessity of creating a place that's worth being in if you really want people to congregate. So complete streets sort of say that. Streets should be much more than just moving cars fast. Trail networks, as I talked to, shifting behavior and safe routes to school. So those are all things I'll, I'll give examples of in, in, in my comments here this afternoon. Um, and here's first of my, uh, first of my 10 ish things. It is time for us to start crossing a, a disciplinary lines. You may work in public health, or you may work in beautification, or you may just work in a neighborhood association, or you may work on your own front yard, I don't know. But um, these are the kinds of disciplines that have to start talking to one another. And what I often say to people who are ready to step into this, if they're at an agency or at a nonprofit, like, is start personal conversations with the people that are in this work, right? And take out to lunch is my sort of euphemism for begin a dialogue. Start a conversation, open doors to this, find out where they are. And this is a very important, the first thing to say in these conversations is not, so what are you going to do to help beautify Sullivan County? What are you going to do? Mark Fenton said we have to make it safer for walking away. What are you going to do? You say, I think we have common goals. I'm trying to make it safer for people to walk and bike and make a more beautiful and inviting space, a thickier community, as Mark called it. And I understand you're trying to help the local economy. I think those align. Could we talk together about that? Or uh, you're trying to move vehicles, your transportation, move tra vehicles efficiently and safely down our roads. In fact, lots of the things Mark talked about sounded like they were about safe and efficient movement of vehicles, but while allowing for people to cross those streets too. Are you guys with me on this? So, so, okay, so we start those conversations in the most comfortable space, and if it's out to lunch, that's great. If it's over coffee, that's great. Um, perhaps not pounding the table at a public meeting is not the way to start the conversation. I'll just throw that out there. Having said that, when we have these conversations, let's remember my three numbers. Do you guys remember my three numbers? What's 20? Oh, come now. I mean, 30. 30 is the first one. What's 30? 30 minutes per day, and how much do kids need? Do you remember? There you go. Excellent. I'm impressed. All right. So and did, the reason that's important is that we got to put scale out there. We're not trying to turn everybody into a marathoner. What happens is, no, seriously, as soon as you start having the health conversation, they say, so wait, do I have to be one of these lycra-wearing guys on a $3,000 bike that commutes 20 miles to work every day? No. Thank you very much. I'd love you to ride your bike with your kid to school or on the weekend to run errands or something. That'd be great, too. Half a mile. That counts. Uh, 20? The bad one, 20% actually meeting those guidelines and 365, not days of the year, 
There you go, 1,000, add three zeros, debts. Just to put on scale. So if you don't do anything else, hanging on to those three numbers starts to unify this conversation that it's not just an obesity epidemic, remember, but an epidemic of physical inactivity, and that really what we want to do is build spaces for that. Having said that, I think an early step in the process is to begin forming the stealth team. You remember my little, uh, uh, my little sort of moniker about that, which says um, you want to look at people who have the big vision, they get the big picture. Second, it is their job to be working on this stuff. And third, they have reach and influence, so when we need a larger group, they can make that phone call. They have the loaded, as, a used, as we used to in the old days call it, the ro Rolodex. Do you remember a Rolodex? They've got the Rolodex with all the right phone numbers in it. Now it's the, uh, the loaded uh, uh, iPhone. So um, starting the conversation about what your, your stealth team and is your community is not a theoretical construct, though. I mean, it's a very concrete thing. And I'm going to make one other a piece of advice around this. My experience is you can't just think about disciplines. Okay, we need somebody from public works and somebody from planning and an elected official. Indeed, when it comes to creating the team, the personalities matter. They have to be the kind of folks that can work across disciplinary lines, that can hear people outside their discipline. I'm happy to hear the public health perspective, the planning perspective, the affordable housing perspective, the transit perspective, right? In other words, I get that. And if I don't, probably not the right person for my stealth team. I mean, maybe later on we'll get you in and you'll, we'll get you excited about it. But boy, the initial core team have got to be people that are not stuck on only their agenda. Questions or thoughts on that? Because that's a pretty important point. So I think about, when I work with a community and actually planning this exercise, like if, if you know, you and I talked earlier about uh, Center for Discovery, and if you guys were going to try to convene a stealth team around Hurleyville and the work you're doing there, um, I would actually say, let's talk about actual personalities. We'll talk about the conceptual positions, but then who's the real person that gets this, that could sit in that chair, in that chair, in that chair? Because personalities do matter. Questions on that? Thoughts? Comments? You guys good? All right. I know I get talking fast, so you're allowed to interrupt. I don't, that's why I take a breath once in a while. I think it's important to get people out and start looking at this space and not simply a, you know, it's easy to sit in conferences and look at lots of slides. Um, my understanding is that sort of, you know, w when, like for the Broadway project, you know, in Monticello, it's really common that if the planning or the, the DOT in this case, right, that's a state road, they put up the, all the boards at the front of the room when you have the public meeting and they say, this is our analysis of the alternatives. These are the three alternatives. These are the pros and cons. Which is great, do that, but for Christ's sakes, go out and walk it, too. You know, before you've done the project. Let's go out and talk about it and have an experience and talk to business owners. Knock on their doors. Say, I know you're working, so you can't do the whole walk with us, but talk. We did exactly this in Dorchester, Massachusetts. We did a walk audit down Dorchester Avenue with the Department of Transportation, Boston, and the Boston Health Department. They were co-conveners of this walk audit, so that was important. And then the local business group was also, so, and we knew there were business owners who could not leave and walk with us. So our goal was to make it a moving walk audit where as we came to their storefront, we knocked on the door, they came out and we said, talk to us about how parking is working out here. Where do your customers come from? Where, how far away would they be willing to park? What would we have to do if we're going to expect them to park on the backside? So you know in Monticello, how lots of the parking is behind the building. What do we need to do through the little alleyways to make them inviting enough? So we really talked literally about this yesterday. So we were doing that in the walk audit before the project was even conceived, so that stuff's built in. And I know you guys did lots of this, but I mean, it's a good example. It's a nice case study of where getting out and seeing the space. But here we are doing our walk audit in Liberty. We're walking from sort of the downtown up, up Main toward uh, the elementary school. We're going to watch school dismissal. Here we built a human curb extension. Do you see that? Because we were talking about would curb extensions be good here? These are crossings where kids are trying to get across the street from the school side to the neighborhood side right, move uphill, which we saw tons of them do during school release yesterday, um, maybe some curb extensions where the curb bumps out. So we actually made a human one, and then this was my mom right here. She looked really good. And unfortunately, we lost this guy out here. That was, but it was, taught us a lesson. We'd made it too wide. No, I'm kidding. See, it was a joke about him being out too far on the road. It's just too late in the afternoon. Everybody kind of going in the hypoglycemic crash, three cookies, and you're done now, right? All right, fine. We didn't lose anybody. Um, I really think the best thing about walk audits is not simply doing the walk. It's first doing a little bit of a preamble so we make sure we're aware of those four elements of active community design. Do you remember in my presentation I said there are ten to four things that the research suggests define places where we see more routine activity? I'm going to query the group right now. Wake yourselves back up. What are the four things? Not a theoretical question, not a rhetorical. We're not moving to the next slide to give me the four things that characterize settings where we tend to see people be more physically active. What were they? Good, good connected network. So the built network, which was actually number two in the order that I did it. I did something first on the more macro scale. That's sort of the meso, the medium scale. What's on the macro scale? 
What? Say it. Land use, mix of land uses. We've got to have destinations that are even close enough, right? I've got to have live and work and shop and play and learn and pray closer rather than only spread out. Segregated land use means I'm never going to walk between them because they're just too far. So one, mix it up. Two, good connected networks. Three, next scale down. No, that's last. I'll say yes, safety, but that's really four. That's kind of the, then I make it safe. But when I get to my destination, it's got to reward me rather than punishing me for being outside of the car, right? So that's site design. That's the details. So what, here's why I'm re recounting this. When we do these walks, it's really important. People get into a mode where they're just talking about the sidewalk. So, which I thought was really interesting. We didn't do that. We really made ourselves get out of that when we walked, for example, in, in downtown Monticello. I thought we did. We talked about the land uses. We talked about the fact that when you're right there, you're close to a civic center, a county buildings, um, community center that acts as a senior center, lots of senior housing only a block away, multiple different types of businesses, schools not far in another direction. Um, so, so you've got that mix of land uses there, right? Housing literally now because of the zoning, potentially housing above retail, right down to the parcel level. So, uh, so the mix of then the connected network, which is the actual, the infrastructure on the ground. Then third, site design, building at the street versus behind a parking lot, street trees, awnings, benches, that's it. And then safety, is it safe enough? Do we slow traffic? Can we get across the street? Can we uh, uh, make our way with comfort? So talk about that, do the walk, and then I love nothing more than taking people right after that into a planning session and saying, okay, now what next? What might we actually do here? That's when we roll out the aerial photos, the maps, give people markers and say, now where was the crossing where we saw the goat trail, the worn path on the ground, or where we saw a lot of the kids come out of the school and cut back into the neighborhood where we might want to make that a more formal path, right? Um, or we might want to improve the crossing. So think in front of the Liberty School, we saw all that traffic and we said, boy, this might be a spot to improve that pedestrian crossing. There's that crossing guard trying to do the job. How can we help her? By design. Um, there are checklists out there. People sometimes ask when I do these workshops, why don't you give out a checklist? You can. Those, so, and by the way, I'll make these slides available to Sullivan. They'll put them up on the site so you can get any of these resources and links. So if you were to say, Mark, I'd like to host a walk audit. I'm a, not an expert. I've never done this before. There are guiding documents like these. A couple I have on my website, too, how to lead a walk audit. So I'm just telling you, you don't have to start from nothing here if you start doing some of this kind of stuff. And I say when we go on the walks, let's, of course, be careful. I don't want people getting run over or anything. Um, but let's think, make sure we're thinking about all users, young, old, somebody who's in a wheelchair, somebody who's pushing a stroller, somebody who's visually impaired or blind. Um, we often reach out very intentionally to those communities to make sure they join us on the walk. So I love nothing better than to have somebody in a wheelchair on a walk audit because, man, you can talk about it conceptually, what cro why cross slope is a problem on a sidewalk, but you have somebody in a wheelchair who is constantly sliding into the road, then everybody in the group gets it. Because they're all, all nervously hovering along next to the person in the wheelchair going, oh my God, I'm so worried Bob's going to slide into the... It's the best teachable moment that I've ever had on walk audit. Okay? So, thinking about, have a kid along. Have my mom along. You know, you sort of really be open about that. And then the last thing is actually we do a little scoring exercise. As we walked yesterday, we would ask, now on a 0 to 10 scale, how is this feeling based on the mix of land uses, connectivity of the network, site design, you know, sort of all of those four attributes, safety. What do you give it? Do you give it a three? Give you give it a nine? And then, then we can, that informs what we might want to improve. This is really interesting because it was sort of when we were in Lake Kanyanga, uh, we, we, um, we were walking there right down the street. There's Dan taking us right in the middle of the road, not breaking rule number one already. Be careful. Here we are in the middle of the road. But he pointed out to me, he said, you know, one of the issues with this triangle here, I said, have you ever thought about closing off one leg of the triangle, maybe to make that festival space or just not, you know, sort of clean it up, narrow it down, make it better for pedestrians? He said, the problem is we got a lot of truck traffic. And I'm thinking, a lot of truck traffic. Two seconds later, giant Budweiser truck comes through right where we were standing. What a clipped us if we were standing there in the moment that, that but the point was, we're, because if we were talking about this theoretically, that would only be a theoretical problem. Because we were out doing the walk audit, I see it. I understand what kind of, everybody in the group understands the kind of turning radius big trucks need. And now we say, hmm, here I was talking about putting out some planters to beautify the corner here and kind of, you know, make it safer for pedestrians. We're going to have to think about what that really looks like. Got it? Anybody see that? How that's different? Okay. Oh, stop for ice cream on your walk audit, for sure. You know, if you can, do something fun, always. That was us in Evansville, Illinois. A very, we got a lot done. We had some city councilors. We got them totally loosened up. Later, we stopped for alcohol, too. We just started feeding them drinks, saying, would you, and how about this? And how about this? <laughs> right? You're, they start nodding their heads. <laughs> um, I'm kidding about that. We didn't do that at all. That's bad. I didn't even say that. I didn't mean it. Um, 
So let me tell you a quick story. My hometown hosted the Regional Planning Authority, see Genesee Transportation Council, which is the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, for the region around Rochester. Did a series of workshops, and one happened to be my hometown, Brockport. So I was on the team that was contracted to do this. I get to lead a walk audit in my hometown. The prodigal son returns to blah, 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 and lead a group on a walk. But we did one. Interestingly enough, that's State Route 19, which is the north-south route. And it was due for, it was on the transportation improvement plan. So not unlike Broadway, it was, we knew it was pending. It was coming. The project was coming. So we led this walk audit, and we walked all up and down the street, got business owners, uh, residents, parents. We built a human curb extension. It turns out there's a side street on the right on the picture you can't see. And so this is a natural crossing point. Even there's no, no street on the left. The streets are offset. If you've ever been in downtown Brockport, they don't line up very nicely. So, and if those offsets, you end up with these weird sort of crossings. Anyway, point of the story was, the, as we were talking, they said, you know, college kids are constantly popping out from behind these vehicles to cross here. What if we had a curb extension to kind of protect that space and get the kids across? So there we are. In fact, who's the person who's the SUNY grad I was talking to, to a few minutes ago? When, you know Ray Duncan, who was in political science? That's him right there. Sadly, he was hit, but no, he not, cannot hit. It was great. So we, um, we, but here's the funny thing. This is 2003. We're doing this walk audit. People from DOT, landscape architect, planner, and all this stuff. Construction's in 2011, because that's how these projects move. So we got to get in early in these conversations. And there's one of those curb extensions being built at the very place we built it. We proposed it. There it is now finished. There is a college student not getting run over because she's so much more visible, because there are signs like this saying, yield the pedestrian, it's high visibility. That truck was not at all surprised to see her there because the design of the road, right? was giving very clear messaging. I submit to you, I'm not saying that me doing the walk out, but it beginning a process early enough so that he couldn't say to you, well, we're already at 60% design, we're already at 80% design, party's over, can't do that, really, really matters. And I know some of you have lived through all this, you know, you're nodding because I know you've been, but I think it was great because that was really, the walk audit was the genesis of an community advocacy group now called Walk Bike Brockport, which, by the way, embraced their, their, uh, the, the garden club, their beautification groups. Um, some of the arts folks from SUNY Brockport got involved. They said, could we be doing art installations at locations? You should see the cool art installation down at the Welcome Center along the Erie Canal, connected by the trail. Some of the faculty. So my point is, there was such a natural genesis. That if there's a, they, they launched a program called Art Walks on Water around the Erie Canal Towpath Trail. Art installations all up and down that corridor, I give Brockport no small amount of credit for so help, helping to launch that, um, and, and yet also the boring stuff like a safe pedestrian crossing comes out of it. So there's Route 19 before. Now remember, it was up for a street improvement. What did improvement historically mean when we talked roadways? What would improve that road? Widen it up, more lanes, move those cars through faster. Could have gone that way, right? But because this community was engaged, that's what they got didn't get wider. If anything, the lanes got a little narrower, plus we added nice high visibility bike lanes and these curb extensions with the pedestrian signage. I, I would submit to you, you say to me, Mark, that's not a cataclysmic change. It is compared to what it could have become. Had that become kind of a through highway, it would have been disastrous. Instead, that's a very bicycle and pedestrian, as well as functional automobile roadway. It can be done. It can be done. We have to be in those conversations. By the way, that is the roundabout at the, the, the north end of town. People were convinced, roundabouts, these are a problem, right? That's at intersection of routes 19 and 31, north end of town, which we also proposed and supported. And now, because again, there was an advocacy group, every time somebody showed up at the public meeting to say, these roundabouts are a disaster. You know, we got a lot of older drivers. They're going to get into that thing and not know how to get out. They're just going to drive around, right? Around, they're going to go around indefinitely until they run out of gas because, you know, Roundabouts are so hard to drive in. Now, what the research tells us, just to be clear, is roundabouts tend to, in the right kinds of installations and properly designed, reduce collisions, both frequency and severity, almost eliminate fatal collisions, because you don't end up with the classic T-bone, somebody trying to get through with the yellow light right at the end, getting plowed by a vehicle in the other direction or whatever. Um, instead, what you get is, if you have collisions at all, they're tiny little fender benders of two vehicles going 12 miles an hour, right? That's by design. That's the engineering of them. That's right. And they're very safe for pedestrians, bicyclists. There are lots of, they maintain flow. There's no stop in a cycle, right? There's no phase where my direction is stopped for 25 or 35 seconds, right? So there's a kind of a more even flow. So this is what we know from the research, none of which matters if people are convinced roundabouts are horrible, right? So our job is to populate the conversation with the evidence, which that group did. 
So the group that was formed out of an initial walk audit became the advocacy group that sort of shepherded this redesign of their main street, basically, through an entire process that I believe has been very successful. So it's a good example, and it's in New York, and I could give you many others from around the state. This just happens to be one I'm intimate with. Questions, thoughts, comments, protests, rebuttals. You, you've been on that corridor and seen it. And that, and that street does feel, doesn't it feel better than sort of, you've got in and out. Yeah. One cycle, like, you know, sort of, the, well done. See? And you're not that smart, right? You know, you're just a regular guy. I'm not a rocket scientist. See, regular guy. He, I can do it, and I'm really not smart. Hand back there. I'm sorry. I'm yes. Correct. Correct. I actually took a picture of a young woman trying to cross there, standing, sort of peeking out from behind the cars. Now imagine if there were a curb extension that went out far enough and maybe some signage and the high visibility markings that sort of told cars, hey, expect to see people. I know just the one you're talking about. So, these are all, this is State Route 19. Just want to be crystal clear. The state has theoretically, you know, embraced complete streets, theoretically. It is our job at each community now to demand it, to make sure the designs actually meet that standard of performance. So in other words, the notion that a state DOT, and I'm not knocking the state DOT, I'm just saying that if you don't ask for it, it still might not happen that way, right? It's still, a hand. Everybody hear her? So she's saying, I would much rather have a car going 27 miles an hour driving in front of my business then going 47 miles an hour because they're much more likely to see my window display to see the nice tables I put out front the plants the fact that I've got an active storefront and I've got oh, a sale going on in other words businesses know and by the way they really like customers going by at three to five miles an hour which is sort of walking speed right so that the best speed would be no I'm not kidding give me a this customer or one going 12 miles an hour on my bicycle still better and then third I take a car going 25 last is a car going 50 that's the last customer because I'm not going to see them they're gone great point sir great what town okay Great. So that's true. And we'll see. So once successful, once these ones, we'll see uh, uh, elected officials, social like trustees saying, you know, I'll do, we'll do one a month and I'll do, you know, you could, Charlie, Charlie wants this yesterday, right? So no, seriously, I mean, which I commend. I highly, Dave was out there when we did Monticello. So, you know, sort of elected and, and staff could, can use that as an opportunity to have a communication. And here's what I've heard from the folks that I've worked with on this kind of stuff. They say, it is so much better to do communication with residents walking shoulder to shoulder because when we're like this we're looking in the same direction we're working on a solution when we're across the table from one another when I'm in the front of the room behind the table and you're out there it's immediately confrontational so why don't we stand next to each other walk through the solution together I mean I know that sounds all touchy-feely I'm sorry am I getting too squishy on you but I swear to God having done lots of these it actually changes the entire tenor of the conversation to be walking side by side and looking in the same direction, now we're jointly solving problems as opposed to, I'm up here and you're barking at me to solve the problem. Is that fair? Didn't it feel that way yesterday a little bit? I mean, it was a positive vibe, wasn't it? Am I fair? Was it, did, ah, <laughs> but you, the vibe was good on our walk, except when I had to have my little tirade. But after that, it, yeah, I, <laughs> I'll tell you that story at the end because I, I love Denise so much, I don't want to think I... So when we do this, now, there could be nothing better than to finish a walk like that and get people together to actually talk about concrete next steps, all right? And so convening something like a community forum or a summit where we pull the stakeholders together, you know, you had a really interesting mix in the room. It's a little change now as people have left, but even now, you have a range of elected and, a, and staff and uh, community advocates and professionals in the private sector in the room, and they make up for great kind of planning groups in a community across disciplines. So beginning to build a plan, you know, and here's what I often say when I'm facilitating these, I do not want the 50 item list. I like a number that's less than 10 and sometimes less than five. Let's get five or six initial goals. Let's get them done and then move out to the next tier. All right, so I do challenge you or, or suggest to you to be careful about that. So let's talk about some of the concrete examples of how we might do that. One might be to do a trails inventory. 
Now, you'd say, well, we've got maps that show where the trails are and where in the corridors. I'm also talking about inventorying those goat trails. Remember the trail that Jill and I discovered? I showed you the picture of the student walking from the Monticello schools back over to the Sleepy Hollow housing there. Um, you know, going out and finding those. I was so psyched, by the way, as I pull into Wurtsboro. Now, I've just come into Sullivan County, drop off on, like, one of the first exits, is, you know, the first little hamlet there, and I pull in, and what do I see but... Oh, the DNH Canal, little entry portal here, and a n high visibility crosswalk bring me to that. And if, as I peek back in here, wow, this cool little linear park with. And in fact, I, my understanding is I think it's called Wurtsboro Renaissance, so it suggests to me some affiliation with this organization I'm about to go meet here um, as I'm driving in. Um, and I explored this trail more. I went and found, holy mackerel, look at this. It goes back to, it goes right by the schools. Here it is. Look at this marker here. The canal, original snubbing post, placed at the site of the groundbreaking ceremonies on, and how funny is this? I was born on a July 13th, and it was done originally in July 13th, 1825, and this was when this post was put up in 1970. I just thought, well, this is, this is an omen. I'm in the right place at there, celebrating this trail on my very birthday. Um, and here's the trail further down. Um, but it also, you see the challenges, because I thought to myself, as I further went down, I realized there were these informal goat trails to get back into the trail, but no signage, no actual trail connectors into neighborhoods, at least at this point. Now, there may be some great ones further down. Somebody from Wurtsboro could tell me, oh, Mark, you didn't see the half of it. All I'm saying is, I like the notion that a person would stumble upon this trail, that you couldn't go through Wurtsboro and not find the trail. That's what it should be like. This should be so inviting that it would be impossible for me to pass through your community and not find your very best assets. Not find them. It, would, it should be impossible to not find it. Does everybody understand what I'm saying here? Questions or thoughts on that? And that, that requires everything from the very mundane, the curb appeal, the plantings, the signage, to the mechanics of how do we get across the street and things like that. Um, so... There's an example of a trail where, who knows, maybe some small connectors. You know, I was inclined to ask, would community members let kids from the neighborhood that's right near this goat trail get onto the DNH and walk to the school? As the crow flies, it would be the most direct route. It would be more direct than walking by roads. I want to be clear. In this particular case, the neighborhood I'm standing at when I'm taking this picture. But I could easily imagine parents in the world of marinated in fear, no way, scary men mustaches are back there which I was with a digital camera, God forbid, right? They saw, but, but you get my point. Maybe we couldn't use that trail. What would we have to do to, do to use it? Maybe a group of kids walking together. Maybe what's called a walking school bus. Has anybody heard that term? So the idea of a designated route to school that an adult walks every day, picking kids up along the way like a school bus, but we're on foot. And, you know, a group of neighborhood parents could convene. My wife did precisely this in our neighborhood. We had Mondays and Thursdays. Somebody else had Tuesdays. Somebody else had Wednesday. And all of a sudden parents who are really nervous say, well, there's an adult along, and there's a group of eight kids. How dangerous can it be? And now their kid is walking to school. That might be a way we could repopulate that trail, just as a thought. But when we were in the evergreen housing over in Monticello, this was really interesting. We realized you're not that far from De Hoyos Park. Do I have that right, De Hoyos Park? Is that the proper name? Do I have it? Did I spell it? Thanks. And so there's the park. There's the housing. And you can see through the woods the trail that literally the park's right back up there. I'm at the back edge of the housing. And I was so psyched. Oh, look, a gate so we can go through and walk back. But guess what we found when we looked closer at the gate? There it is. <laughs> Dang it. But I also saw somebody's using this gate to climb over some malfeasance. In fact, I saw Jill go over it, and I was chasing her, saying, hey, this is going to be the second time we're almost arrested today. Come here. Uh, uh, there, there, that's her. But we, you know, the point I'm making is, you see this? There, in the, the way the thing is bulging, kids have been obviously climbing over it. That's how that path is there. Maybe we should take a cue from that. There's demand to be able to get from that housing to that park. And I understand there are liability questions and things like that, but let's figure them out. Let's figure them out. Let's resolve that. Because that's, that's an anti-free-range kid treatment. Would that be fair? Okay. All right. So, um, Oh, we were up at Liberty High School. This is where we did almost get arrested. Liberty High School in the middle school, right up the hill, all sorts of housing. It's, uh, um, is it called Valley View up there? I, can't, I think that's the name. But in any case, here's the point. There's the goat path worn down through the woods. In fact, it's not just a goat path. That's like a mountain bike drop. We could see the trail. I'm thinking, okay, if I'm a kid and I had a bike, I would love zipping down that hill every day. I would be looking forward to going to school if I got to roar down this hill. But it's not even formal trail, right? And we'd worry about erosion, and there are some real implications about that. And how, what's it like in the winter? What's it like when it's wet and rainy and that's mud? So, um, but there's clear demand is the point. So 
remember, my, I started this one as, let's inventory what's out there. Not just the long distance trails, not just the O and W and the D and H and the big connectors that get us from this county to the next. Where are the 100 foot trails, the 300 yard trails that connect some senior housing to the place where they might shop or their pharmacy or their doctor's office or the bus stop that would connect kids to their school, to the park or the playground they'd like to hang at. Everybody got that? And by the way, this, uh, m- m- as you listen to my list, I hope you understand these are not all sort of the tasks just of the municipality or of the county. This could be done and has been in communities where I've worked. A scout troop could take on the task of doing the goat trail inventory. By the way, uh, engineers often call these desire lines. That's a term they use because it indicates desire to travel there, right? So inventorying that could be the Kiwanis Club or the Rotary or a service organization or a church or a school or a... The scouts, as I said, yeah, exactly. So those are the kinds of groups that could take this on. In Boone, North Carolina, just to be clear that it's not only the short ones, this is a slightly longer trail, and you're saying, well, okay, 100 yards, fine, people will walk 100 yards. This is a trail they put along a utility corridor. You can actually see the the, the sewer um, um, pipe there that connects their middle school to a large county park that acts as that school's uh, ball fields and their cross country courses there. This is a team that's going to a game afterwards I, or a sport, some sport, either a soccer game or a cross country meet over there. So those kids are walking over. They said because the trail is now there, they don't have to bus the kids a much more circuitous route on the roads, right? It would have been a five mile bus ride and they have to allocate a bus to that. So they are literally saving money. The investment in the trail long term has saved money for the school because kids now use that to get to for their home field when they walk, they walk to it. Plus, that's part of their warm-up, right? Now I'm warming up as I'm walking over to our soccer game or whatever. And we're doing, a, it's a little more of a free-range life than shepherd them onto the bus yet again, then back off for their activity. I really liked it. Where might we do something like that? What I couldn't help but be in Hurleyville. It's so funny, you and I talked about this before. This slide was already in here. I swear to God, I had thought it. You're not that far at the Center for Discovery from the community college, as you well know. So you have these two sort of major hubs of activity in the, in the county, very, very close. And of course, the trail hub right there, the existing portion of the O&W, can't help but ask, what would it take to connect up to, to the community college? And you say, but Mark, you know, that's a mile and a half. It's a little long for just a stroll. If I've only got an hour between classes and I wanted to zip down and get a coffee, there's some really neat little shops in Hurleyville, you know, some food places. Isn't there a Hungarian restaurant? Did I see that sign correctly in Hurleyville? Is, that, is it good? Looks neat. Looks like a, it looks like a place I'd want to check out. But here's my point. If I only have an hour between classes. But what if at the college I had a shared bike fleet so that I could just borrow one of these bikes anytime because that's a summit bike or whatever we, you know, uh, um, and, and I could zip down the trail and spend a couple of bucks and then zip back up and uh, how cool, would that, and by the way, perhaps folks down at Hurleyville and at the center could get up to the school if they had an activity up there. I see a hand. At the college? Come on, you're messing with me. How did we not talk before? That's the awesome. I want a picture of it because we got to put it right here. Because this is from Grinnell College in Iowa. Good for you. Thank you. That's the coolest. So you're ready. You're ready for the trail. Yes, yes. But a ma- an off-road trail, certainly a lot safer, right? And, and, you know, sort of, so imagine that trail connection down to, okay, so we're ready. It sounds like you're interested. So if only I knew somebody from the college and somebody from the Center for Discovery, if we could get them in the same room at the same time to talk about, where would we do that? What, what regional organization might pull together disparate groups like that? And, oh, Jamie, how are you, man? Okay, you guys get my point. Thanks. I really do want a picture. We're going to put it in before we put these slides. I want your bikes in this photo, not the Grinnell College in Iowa. Please. Right, so there's a whole movement nationally called Recycle a Bicycle, where we take old ones and we kind of pirate parts. And, and, and by the way, one of the coolest programs I know of that is done in Blue Island, Illinois, where the expert doesn't just do it. They do a training program for kids. They take low-income kids who would have no access to a bike otherwise. The kid has to uh, sign up for an eight-week program. They have to commit to classroom, on-bike training, and maintenance training. They learn how to fabricate and maintain their bike. At the end, if they've stuck through the whole thing, their graduation gift is the bike and a properly fitted helmet. They walk out the door. We've raised the next generation of bicyclists, right? Now, that's the way to do a program like that, isn't that? Because that kid now has all the pride of having put that bike together and all the skills to ride it safely and a helmet. They're ready to go. They are repopulating the very roads and trails we're talking about. So, great. Thanks for reminding us about that.
So she's saying, I don't want that to necessarily be a concrete trail. So my experience, that's a long conversation. We could have a detailed talk about that. Um, but I would submit that we're seeing lots of different surfaces being used and being used, designed for the context. So the more rural the trail, the much more likely it is at a soft surface. If we're going to have equestrians on it, then we probably don't want a hardened surface, right? Um, as we get to more urbanized area where volumes of traffic are higher or where huge erosion problems would cause lots of decay or, you know, it would fall apart and we'd be spending a huge amount of time placing gravel back on it. Maybe we go to asphalt and then only in the most urbanized areas, and I'm talking literally cities, do we see a concrete type trail. So that, you know, we think of a hierarchy. We also, I'm mean, increasingly see communities be a little more foresightful about sort of if they take the trail profile, rather than paving a 12-foot segment, they might say, let's pave six feet and then have another couple of feet on each side, like a soft three-foot shoulder, because we find that joggers and, again, equestrians, maybe mountain bikers actually prefer the soft surface, but somebody pushing a stroller, because not everybody is you. You're thinking, I want that soft surface, I'm the enviro guy or gal, and I want to keep, you know, minimize stormwater runoff, but my mom we might keep her off that trail if we don't improve it enough that there's not a tripping hazard. So we want to make sure we're thinking, or this person pushing a stroller. So, so there are a range of treatments depending on users, population density, endpoints, traffic, that, that sort of dictate that. But by no means does anybody say always pave every trail. I haven't heard, you know, the most thoughtful trail networks have a range of, of materials for the context. There's no blanket answer to that. your question is the point, in my book, in my book, based on what I've seen. Uh, for what that's worth. And you might disagree, but, you know, sort of a, my observations from the work around the country say design to the context and, and, and you'll end up doing the best work. Other questions or thoughts or observations? Yeah. So, so I hope the answer is obviously better design first. So she's saying, how do I, I if you have been listening to me, you're, you would already answer and say, clearly Mark says, start at the foundation of the pyramid and design it right first. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't do education programs like the bike program. We could do safe pedestrian education programs. We would want to make it multilingual. We would want to go to where those people live. So we go, if Sleepy Hollow, you mentioned Sleepy Hollow as residents that are out there pushing, why don't we do a ped safety education program targeting them right where they live or wherever it's convenient for them. And by the way, maybe you know, whoever our care providers for kids, if we have working moms, I'd go a step further and I'd say, when I facilitate the walk audit, I'm thinking we should be inviting those very users to be on it, right? We were just doing sort of initial teach mark about the area walk audits the other day. But if you're at all serious about this and want to move forward, because you just asked the question, I assume you're, gonna, you're rolling up your sleeves and committing to this, then I'm thinking let's do some walk audits with the very clients you're talking about and get their insights, because boy, nobody knows better where the challenges are than the very people that are trying to navigate it every day by necessity. And if that means we have to have translation while we're doing that, because, you know, we've got, again, multilingual speakers in the then let's do that. Um, so, so engagement and design from the bottom up is, is it, it, you got to build it right in. I mean, that's the short answer. We could do an entire, you know, a couple hours on that. But, you know, that's right in my wheelhouse. What you're talking about is sort of the only answer is to have their input as early as possible in the process. So, that's sort of a thousand, you know, that's a $64,000 question. Do you want me to redesign Broadway? Do you want me to tell, is it, is it, does it act as traffic calming? Yes. Is it better than if the island's not there? Yes. Is that the design I would have necessarily proposed? I would have actually asked to look at a three lane alignment. We have, there's lots of research that says three lanes can work as well as four if you have a center turn lane with pockets and things like that because if you move the left turning vehicles 
out of the travel lane, one lane can carry surprising volume. So, and then by going from four to three, you can sometimes get room for a bicycle facility that there isn't there. Um, but that, uh, you know, that's sort of backseat driving because I wasn't there through the whole process, uh, and I haven't done any research on sort of what the average daily traffic is on that. So um, I, I think the bottom line, though, on that kind of thing is that's there. You got the design you have. Learn about what's working about it. If it needs some retrofits, like remember the median crossings that I talked about? If there need to be some of those put in, because I saw people using that median island as a crossing refuge already, right? People wandering all up and down the street or wandering out to the island stand. I did it. I am going to admit it. I walked out, stood on the island, then crossed. I mean, I was taking pictures, but still. So my point is only it's done. So now look at what works about it, what doesn't. As retrofit is needed, do so. And when the next generation design comes, like Jefferson, right? That's being done right now. Um, make sure you take the best, you know, best practices. And again, I would engage the very people who are most likely to be using it. That's why I'm saying these walk audits. That's why that's in do the trail inventory. We're finding where people are right now and getting their input on this. Okay. Right. Good. Other thoughts, questions, comments, sir. Yes, the, so there's money called the Transportation Alternatives Program. It still exists, and certainly when you can make a safety case, it always, if, if, if I may call it, enhances your score. So when you just talk about functionality, I want people to be able to walk from point A to B, that's good. And I can say, and I'm going to reduce collisions, improve safety, that, you know, your score is better. Um, uh, and uh, I think the bottom line, though, is here's what we've forgotten. Let me just be clear. This is kind of geeky detail, but you should know this. Any transportation dollars can be spent on bicycle and pedestrian and transit facilities. So it's not like what's called the STP, the Surface Transportation Funds. It's not as if those are only allocated for cars, and then you have to go to the special pile of transportation alternatives money for walking, biking, and transit. That is not true. That's everybody's perception, but it is not true. When you're building a road, you could say, when we build this road or when we pave it, we are going to also do this for pedestrians and bicyclists because it makes it a complete street. Remember my complete street thing? So we need to start thinking about it that way. So that would be my answer. You should look at it. And by the way, look at things like stormwater runoff and where the discharge is. And also, in fact, I'll talk a little more about it. So bear with me. Um, okay. The next thing I'm giving you of my 10-ish is um, you're now starting to worry. You're saying, is 10 really 25? Is he going to go like all afternoon? No, I promise. It's only 10 ideas. Demonstration projects. So these are the kinds of things that are ways to test ideas without actually spending a gazillion dollars or doing anything irreversible. So has anybody seen a thing like this called a parklet? It takes two parking spaces. You put a deck there, basically, in, in a downtown area. And it's a mini park, a parklet. And what it does is access traffic coming. It also provides on-street seating. It slows traffic. Um, there's a coffee shop here. They don't, they don't have tables on the street, but this becomes a place where people come and sit. Um, uh, but this town did a design competition for innovative benches. They needed street furnishing, and rather than they did, we don't have the municipal budget, so we're going to invite organizations, groups, schools, scout troops, service organizations, churches, to participate in a competition. The road, this town is on Route 66, so they went with the Blues Brothers themed bench, right? But we saw all sorts of really cool benches. This is called Guerrilla Wayfinding. This is, there's a website called Walk Your city.org. You can go there and print up signs that you can attach to things with just twist ties. This is a, um, it's a two-minute walk to ice cream. They're, they're, they're telling you the ice cream shop. Note, by the way, are not saying a quarter mile or a half mile or three-tenths of a mile. Two-minute walk. People understand time. We've learned that if you tell them something is a half mile away, they go, oh, better get the car. People don't know a half mile is only a 10-minute walk because we've so unwalked ourselves as a species. So put times in instead. Um, other things we can do. We can improve the visibility of crossings just with paint. This d looks almost like brick or pavers, which, by the way, is very expensive and har hard to maintain in the winter. They get lifted. We looked at a section of brick yesterday. But we can get the same look by painting it or imprinting it, stenciling it. So you get a, wow, what a cool crosswalk. But we keep the high visibility retro reflective paint here. Um, I love those kinds of signs. In Lake Kanyanga, they put them out in the summer. Um, there's a curb extension. Those are nice. Look at the planters and everything. Also exceptionally expensive to build something 
something like that. I mean, I like it. That would be my eventual goal. But short term, Mark, if I want to test the idea of a curb extension, could I do it with a big giant planter? Could I do it with just curbing material, a sign, and paint? Could I do it with a bollards and a um, put some stippling on the concrete? Yeah, the answer is yes. So in other words, I'm showing you examples where we can do the kinds of things I've been talking about for short money, try it out, and even take it out if it's a disaster. These are great ways to test these ideas. Um, in Walcott, Vermont, happy to tell you this quick little story, tiny little hamlet in rural Vermont. Do not tell me my town is too small and we can't do it, okay? Because you're not smaller than Walcott. Trust me, anybody in this room, you're not. They said, you know, this is our little business district. We have a, a, a mill and some other stuff over here. There's a, a little mini mart here. That's the post office. That's the kind of the municipal parking, which is just a big gravel lot. And it's dangerous. We did our walk on it, and people said it's horrible to walk across here. People will literally park at the mini mart and then drive over to the, the post office because it's so dangerous because it's a kind of a free fire zone. I said, well, what would it take to just kind of, would you guys consider creating some kind of control for the opening of the parking area, like with planters or something. There's a mom and her kid actually walking that very distance, right, we're talking about. Anyway, there's the walk right there. The upshot is July of that year. This was April. By July, the local health organization had partnered with the municipal group to buy some planters and some bottles just to kind of define that space. It made the Hardwick Gazette, which is the big local paper. When it makes the Hardwick, you know it's big news. Hard news reporting with the Hardwick. And... Uh, but the deal is, these planters and people have adopted them, they're doing the plantings in the thing, and it just changed the character, and it's also utterly reversible. If it doesn't work out well, they can use them somewhere else if they have to. Not very expensive, good test. They used some vi a very modest little grant from a local health foundation to do that and to change the character of the road. By the way, notice the date, yet again, Mark's birthday, July 13th. I'm telling you, there is something special about that date. And I'm thinking, if you're going to do something this summer, target July 13th. Uh, if you're going to do an event, roll something out, July 13th would be a good date for it. How about these? These are places that have used curb extensions to install bicycle parking. I love the fact that in Boulder, Colorado, yes, one of the communist enclaves, I know. But uh, uh, how cool is this? There's the free bike parking right next to where you have to pay for the car parking. So they're making a clear market-based incentive to you. Go free. Park, for, park your bike. Uh, here's Columbia, Missouri. In North Adams, Massachusetts, northwestern corner of the state, very rural area. They wanted to do bike racks. They didn't have the money, but they do have a cool vocational technical school, Votex school, that's got a great welding program. So that welding program designed and helped build those bike racks. Now it's North Adams Mass. Look, think of the acronym, N-A-M-A, -A, North Adams Mass. Look at the bike rack, N-A-M-A. -A. Oh, isn't that the coolest? So now they have this iconic, definitive bike rack that's their town's bike rack, made by the kids from their community and the Votech school. The deal is a local business caught ponies up the money to help pay for the materials. That's their donation. They, the kids fabricate, the town installs, so it's a three-way partnership, and we're getting bike racks all over downtown North Adams. Changing the environment and short money for everybody involved. Right? Everybody get that? I think that's just a great example of collaboration. In Anaconda, Montana, they wanted to try a curb extension here, but it's on a state route, and so they couldn't get permission to just go do it. So they said, could we have a permit to just try this thing on a Sunday morning? Turns out, you remember the it's ice cream, it's good sign? You remember that little sign? That was sending people down the street. This pharmacy right here had just opened a little ice cream window right there in the corner. So the local health, healthy community advocates got somebody's basement furniture and made a curb extension right there, a little mini park, planters, some furniture. Now, because they have the stealth team, you remember the stealth team with all the different disciplines? The, some concerns were raised. The fire chief's right here, and our, our police, one of them, they said, you know, one thing I'm concerned, this is one of our fire response routes. Will the curvature of the angle there not allow the big fire truck through? So they said, go get the big fire truck and the biggest pain in the rear end driver that we have. Get the grouchiest driver, the one who's most likely to complain about this. Bring the truck down. We'll run it through a few times. Move the divan if we have to. Oh, shift that table over there. And then when they get the angle right, then they can go back to the DOT and say, we've actually tried it, Department of Transportation. So we're not just making this up. We'd like curb extensions. We've actually put them out there. Here are pictures. We brought the biggest fire truck through. When you repave this road, we're not asking for a special project. When you're repaving anyway, and the marginal cost will be exceptionally low, which they knew was coming. They knew they were on the improvement plan to come up the next summer. We'd like those curb extensions put in. Are there questions about the process I just described? You seeing how important them doing the community engagement up front opens the door to a much more respect, receptive response by the, the transportation agency in this case. Questions, thoughts, comments? 
It's just a little pop-up event. And by the way, great social event, too. You know, community, the newspaper shows up. Everybody's out there. It was a great thing. In this town, Youngstown, Ohio, they actually redesigned an entire block. There's an organization called Bell Better Block. So there it is, betterblock.org, where they help people think about, what if we did one of those four to three-lane reductions? Could that really work here? So it's a four-lane road. So on a weekend, they did it with tires and planters and tables and uh, event space. They redefined the block. They painted in some temporarily, that's just tape actually, crosswalks and bicycle decals. They changed the character of the road just for a weekend to try it. You guys could do that. Any number of your communities could try this. I was trying to convince Lake Kanyanga to do that around the triangle. Just for, do a little festival event and close off one leg of the triangle just for a, a day or a weekend and see if the world comes to an absolute end, if the planet actually caves in on itself. Because that's often how we react. Oh, these changes, we can never do it. Then we do this and the world doesn't come to an end and we say, yeah, that's pretty cool. Traffic seemed to slow down and it was a pleasant street to be on, but it moved through just fine. Questions? Huh? By the way, what if we do build this stuff? What if we do put some of these planters in? Who's going to maintain them? Well, you guys know better than I. The, the adopt an island, adopt a trail. I was so interested. Every highway off-ramp has an adopt a thing on it as I'm coming up 17. I would much rather them adopting, you know, traffic calming and neighborhood curb extensions and many roundabouts. I mean, yes, the, the highway off-ramps, it's nice. I'm not knocking it. But I'm just saying. Um, this is the Garden Club in my hometown, Brockport, New York. They've adopted this section of the Erie Canal Trail. Uh, in Kingsport, Tennessee, they have a, adopt a spot, garden plots along the way. And in Cincinnati, Ohio, their roundabouts, the actual landscaping in the islands, is done by adopting entities. So in as much as one of the pushbacks we sometimes get on this infrastructure idea is, is oh yeah, it's not just the initial cost mark. We can get a grant to build it. Who's going to maintain it? Right? So yeah, I can get the grant. I'll build it. But how do I maintain it over time? Well, maybe we have to partner with local agencies, organizations. Um, I could see Center for Discovery saying, we'd like to adopt some of the pieces in the, the Hurleyville area, as an example. And, you know, I talked about that. You know, that's the kind of a thing. And by the way, much easier for an entity or organization to adopt something than an individual. Because if an individual leaves, I got nothing. But, you know, if the scouts adopt it, as kids graduate, new ones come in, and there it is. Let me talk about Safe Routes to School as a specific tool in the toolkit because we have visited, we saw the school, the traffic. Lots of people are driving to pick kids up at Liberty Elementary, but that's kind of common across the country. That just happened to be the, the laboratory we saw. But an awful lot of kids are walking too. And the premise of Safe Routes to School is let's maximize the number of kids walking and biking. We spoke, the superintendent joined us, and he said their walk zone in the Liberty Schools is 1.5 miles. I have that right, Charlie? He told us one and a half, didn't he? So one and a half miles, kids, they're theoretically walking to school. Now, what really is happening, we suspect, is a lot are being driven. We saw dozens of cars in the shop, right, or the, the market right over there, food right uh, market, um, and many lined up in front of the school, lots of traffic. This poor crossing guard, bless her soul, was directing traffic. She was safely getting kids across, but a lot of cars, um, not just the buses. So uh, the Safe Routes to School premise says, let's use the five E's. All right, engineering and enforcement. Let's educate and encourage people. Let's evaluate. Where are kids coming from? Why are they driving now? Are the parents driving? Um, so we did this. Let me tell you the quick story of Columbia, Missouri, because I want to make the point that the, still the gold standard is the base of the pyramid. So in Columbia, Missouri, they have this traffic jam at the school. They were setting up walking school buses. Parents were not letting their kids walk to school, largely because, get this, the traffic at the school was so bad, they were afraid they were going to get run over in the last 200 yards. Let me say this again. It wasn't the whole trip. They said the traffic at the... So those parents were then doing what? Driving their kids, adding to the very traffic. So it's a death spiral, right? So now more drive. It's even less safe. Even fewer are willing to walk. So we did a walk on it. And when we did, we discovered a cool little bridge out the backside of the... Uh, I'm sorry, a, a, a park on the backside of the school. And the, a trail through it goes over a bridge. Just like we discovered yesterday. We, we were reminded that at the downside of the fields at Liberty Elementary, there's a nice little bridge over the creek that takes you into your riverfront kind of green space. Um, so in this bridge, what they do is we propose, could kids drop off in the park? There's a parking lot over there and walk to and from school. So we actually did a trial. They said, Mark, we want you to come back and plan it. I said, I'll only do it if for a week in April you do a test and encourage the kids to walk and bike in school for that week. And then at the end, um, uh, we'll talk to the kids and then design a plan. So we did that. And the kids actually, we did a focus group. They drew pictures, told us the story. The little Sierra said, my mom was worried about it. There, notice every picture has the bridge and the creek. Um, she said, I had to hold hands with my brother. See the picture that he is holding hands with her brother. And this little boy said, you know, some of the guys said they saw a bear in the woods, but I'm pretty sure it was a dog. There it is. Um, these two guys were total characters. This one said his buddy fell in the water. This one said his buddy fell in the water. I asked this guy, I said, why does the path get so skinny? 
skinny in the distance, and the building is really tiny up there. He goes, it's called perspective. <laughs> Fair enough. So I'm giving the talk that night. I've got school board, city planning, the mayor, uh, all these people in the room. I'm giving this talk, bought a bunch of teachers and parents, and I'm showing the pictures, telling the story, and this woman in the front row, when I say that, she goes, <gasps> And I said, are you okay? And she goes, yeah, I'm the art teacher. I can't believe you remembered perspective. That's awesome. <laughs> it was the highlight of the whole thing. Anyway, the point is they made a bunch of recommendations and in fact did this. They said, we don't want to just do this once in a while. If you're serious, we're telling you, we, the students, like walking through the park. So let us drop off. Let the buses drop off over there. And let's improve the trail and let's plant a garden or some trees. And you ready for this? This is the policy they put in place. A five-minute safety delay. If you pull up in front of the school, those cars are frozen for five minutes. So if your kid is getting in your car in front of the school, they go to the gym and hang for five. While all the kids who are walking and bicycling get to walk, because they're walking through the park or walking home with a walking school bus. Or what. But what do you think kids started to say to their parents? Under no circumstances, pick me up at the school. I don't want to sit in the gym. I want to take off with my buddies with the walking bus or across the... So the kid, because of the P policy, right, at the very base of my pyramid, that's what actually led to the... Now, we had to make the environmental changes, too. The trail through the park, the parking area at the other side, slow traffic and all that. So there's my point. There's my point. Safe routes to school can do it, but we've got to go for policy change. Number nine, complete streets. We should be thinking about complete streets at every turn, and indeed, I think you should be formally adopting it. You should be actually... Now, the premise of complete streets says a street's not complete unless we take into account all four user groups. Pedestrians, bikes, transit, motor vehicles. It doesn't say stripe a bike lane everywhere. It says always think about all four users. Different designs for different settings, not unlike the trail question. So, what I think is that everybody from county ledge to the town and village boards to the planning boards and the school boards should all vote a resolution in support of Complete Streets. This language exists. You can go to the Complete Streets website. There's sample language. There's sample language from communities around the state of New York that have embraced this. Um, but we should be saying formally every time we touch the road, including routine maintenance and paving. Mark, what about rural roads? Are you telling me I've got to build sidewalks all over the county? Not going to happen. Not going to happen. But... We are seeing a movement toward paving shoulders on rural roads. And it turns out, you ready who's driving this? Transportation engineers. Because there's a very good body of evidence that they're much safer to have at least some shoulder and, wait for it, maintenance costs are lower. Because if I can move stormwater discharge further away from the edge of the road, just a little bit, even a couple of feet, then the, er the erosion at the edge is less and I have to repave less often. So we're finding that engineers are now a part. In fact, there's a kind of a, a maxim floating around that there are 22 reasons at least that shoulders are good, separate from the fact that they provide a space for pedestrians and bicyclists. They improve the safety, so we have fewer drivers ending up in the ditch. Um, they provide a place for a car to pull over. They apply space for maintenance and operations to set up signs and trucks to pull off and uh, um, uh, right turning movements. They provide structural support and stormwater discharge. Here's my point. This research is out there. Don't let anybody tell you. It, we don't don't start talking to us about paving shoulders. There's no logic to it because there's tons of logic to it. We can explore it in more detail if anybody wants to. Questions on that? They pay for themselves in the long-term maintenance reductions, those kind of pavings. That's hard to convince people. And let's be opportunistic. If I'm going to make it... So Ma Ashland, Kentucky, small, rural, eastern Kentucky, not two nickels to rub together. This is a poor town. But they got some money to do work on sewers. So they were fixing their sewers and their water pipe system. When they dug up the road, they said, we're going to put it back and put in curb extensions and widen sidewalks. And at the marginal cost will be very modest as opposed to the total cost of the product. So be opportunistic. When we're doing work anyway, that's when we make the improvements. It doesn't always have to be the special bike or pad or beautification project. Any time we're doing other work, we should be asking, how can we make it work better? So if this is a utility corridor, the old trail corridor, so could we, when we're doing something back there anyway, could we improve that trail? How do you pay for it? Well, in Topeka, Kansas, and I just use Topeka because it is not a notorious, not notoriously, um, um, if you will, uh, a progressive community. It's reasonably conservative. They're very cautious with money. They voted on themselves a half-cent sales tax surcharge to improve their streets. They had so many streets that were torn up and needed to be improved and fixed and repaired. And they decided that when we do it, the health people stepped up and said, we will help you, Public Works, get your Fix the Streets campaign passed, get the referendum passed. If you, Public Works, make promise to us that when you do the work on the roads, you'll make them complete streets. Everybody see how that quid pro quo was? Health says, of course we should fix the potholes. But would you agree that when we fix the potholes, we also should look at when we can add a bicycle lane or when we can repair the crosswalk or the, the sidewalk too? Everybody get that? Right? 
we, these are not adversarial relationships. They have to be collegial relationships because we're all going in the same direction. That guy, by the way, I mentioned him. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Jim Ogle, the reason his picture is there, I met him. I met him nine months before that picture was taken. He was 70 pounds heavier at the time. We gave him a pedometer. He started walking. He's with a local radio station. He totally embraced the active lifestyle. He shows me his arm. He goes, Mark, you know how I did this? Mountain biking. And he was like so proud of himself that he'd busted his arm mountain biking because he'd, he'd found his inner athlete. He'd started walking, but now he's mountain biking, doing all this stuff. And his radio station drove this campaign. He said, we, I get it now. We've got to fix these streets because people have to, kids be, have to be able to ride their bikes to school. He became a vocal advocate. He went through the personal change, and then he brought it to his community. It was a really cool story. He's such a nice guy. Look, if we're really going to do this, you can't just have this leadership team. You need action teams actually working on the specific initiative, the updating the zoning ordinance, doing the complete streets, or the walk-to-school program, or the food system stuff that I haven't done remote justice to, but, but I think you, know, you have a flavor for how it would fit into this. Here's one recommendation. If you're going to set up teams, committees, do not have monthly meetings. Nobody's interested. They got it. You get, you're meeting yourselves to death, everybody. You, people who volunteer, you're already on nine different things. You're coaching, you work at your parish, you're now doing beautification right now. You don't need this. So instead, make them be action teams that are focused on just getting a thing done, getting that transportation uh, inv trail inventory done or whatever. Um, and very specifically, um, this is, I see I said 10, it's really 11. As part of the Complete Streets thing, we've really got to, or, or any of them, we've got to move to policy. The gold standard is still the bottom of the pyramid. Remember my pyramid. Always ask yourself, how am I moving to the bottom of the pyramid? Changing policy, changing policy, changing policy. That's where the permanent change comes. So, um, 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 for example, this is called the National Association of City Transportation Officials, a national transportation organization, has published two great guidelines, the Urban Bikeway Design Guide and the Urban Roadway Design Guide. These guides, many communities across the country are officially actually adopting them. Don't update, don't rewrite your code Liberty could, by reference, adopt these guides and say, these are our guidelines. And it doesn't mean every road's going to have a protected bike lane. It just says that's now in the realm of stuff we can do. All right? And they have all sorts of examples. Yeah, they have bigger roads for heavy thoroughfare. They also have alleyways and shared streets and little neighborhood streets. They've got all the examples in there. So don't think urban means New York City. Another example, it really is time to update zoning. We just heard a great presentation in the other room uh, when they talked about land banking and sort of dealing with blighted properties and so on, expediting the process. Your zoning has to say what you want. Um, it intrigues me that across the country, not just here, we still continue to turn stuff like this, arable farmland, into stuff like this. Yet another single-family home subdivision where every trip by design will be by car because we're not within walking distance of any, everything. And I'm not doing this just to stroke you guys. I didn't I mean, but I really, one of my excitements about the Hurleyville project is the notion of creating a village center there where we have housing, um, um, educational activities, um, um, light industry, cottage industry, you know, sort of all sorts of stuff happening right in a walkable village center. That's really the model. That's really the, and zoning should reward that. Zoning should say, this is the easiest path to permit. If you want a permit, you can, the easiest way to get a permit, the low, least barrier is to build, do these kinds of things simple stuff like the subdivision regulations that say, yes, sidewalks on both sides. So I'm back in um, the start of my trip, my visit, Wurtsboro, where in the old downtown you have the sidewalks and the buildings are up and you have front porches. And then this is what we built in the lower picture here for the last 30 or 40 years, kind of classic. It, what boggled my mind but didn't surprise me at all because I've seen it all over the country, I'm seeing suburban style development in some of the most rural areas in the country. That looks like suburbia. Big wide roads, no sidewalks, houses set back. We say that's our, well, I moved here for the rural experience. I don't really think that's rural. I think that feels like suburbia, just a different kind. We can do better, right? We can do better. If we're going to do it, let's design it in a way that the free-range kid could actually walk to school or to his friend's house. We know better, all of those things. One of the very simple steps that I'm leaving communities with, you could start this tomorrow. If there are people, who, in, is there anybody that's a planner in here? by profession as a planner, any of you guys left, one of the simplest changes we make is communities often when a project is coming, like the new Walmart, Brockport, there's Brockport's Walmart, yay, we got Walmart. In fact, that's their second Walmart. The, the first one now still sits as an empty shell. Giant parking lot, empty Walmart, new one, my half mile down the road, heartbreaking to me. Think of the stormwater runoff alone that that thing is generating, you know, unused. But anyway, setting my heartbreak aside, we would normally, a, a development like that triggers what's called a traffic impact analysis. Count the number of cars that will come in and out, and if, if needed, put in a signal light or turning lane. We have to mitigate the impacts. Why don't we always just do, and I've had planning 
staff across the country change this just as a procedure. Why don't we do a multimodal transportation analysis where you estimate the number of pedestrian, bicycle, and transit trips as well? So yes, count car trips, but how many kids might walk here? How many people might take the bus or ride a bicycle here? And then let's do mitigation in all four categories. Maybe we need a transit shelter, maybe. And this is, by the way, a Walgreens uh, in an area outside of Chicago, Oak Park, Illinois, where they did just that. Look at the bike rack. Look at the pedestrian-oriented entrance. The parking is behind the building. This is seating for a bus stop. These ladies are sitting at a bus stop here. Notice the native plantings and things like that. So in other words, they did all these things as part of this mitigation. All of the modes are being accommodated, not just the car because they just built it into their review process now. So you could, any of the communities represented in this room could start doing an MMTA instead of a TIA. That's a procedural change you could start tomorrow. Are there questions? Do you guys understand what I just described? Bring that to your local planning board or your council, a board. To be very clear, this is Mark Fenton being a pain in the rear end, my parting thought. There are two reasons people tell me they can't do this. We technically don't know how. We don't know, you know, this is advanced stuff. We don't, it's not true. We've got lots of good guidelines out there, lots of good examples. These practices, Pete said it the other night at dinner. He said, Mac, sounds like most of the stuff you talk about has been tried somewhere already. That's absolutely true. We'll find a community that's similar to you that's done it and learn from them. So it's not a technical question, and it's not a financial question. Many of the things I've talked about are like paint and signs and sort of changes to what we're doing anyway, just applying it differently. So don't give me the technical brush off and don't give me the financial because I simply won't accept it. Those are not the reasons not to do it. The reason we don't do this stuff is lack of will, lack of vision and lack of will. You have the vision now. Now bring the will to your elected and appointed leaders and your staffs and yourselves and do it. Yeah? It is. No. No, and it's not. It's just called North Central. It's not on my website. North Central Montana Transit. North Central Montana. So why is my picture not coming up? Is there not a picture on your screen back there? No, there. There's no picture on that? Why did you change it? I'm kidding. There's my kids again. Um, this is an urgent thing, right? These guys deserve nothing less than this. We can do it. It means we may have to ruffle feathers occasionally, but for the most part, I don't think we have to. I think in many cases, I'll go back to my opening point, if we were to start these conversations with, I think we have common goals, you and I are really trying to do the same thing. Housing authority, transit authority, uh, uh, transportation person, land use planner, we're really trying to get to the same place. Economic development person, right? We really are. Everybody agrees we'd like to raise a generation of kids that are healthier, not less healthy than us. So let's decide that's where we're going and then figure the path out. Thank you guys very much. It's been a great day. Go do it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inspiring us and moving us, and uh, uh, kicking us in the right direction today. <laughs> Enjoy. And I just wanted to remind everyone about two things. First of all, uh, many of you signed up for the um, interpretive walk that's going to occur, and it's right outside the front door right now after we disperse. Also on the table on your way out, uh, there is an evaluation. This helps us to guide what next year's program could be and what our seminars, free seminars, the first Wednesday of every month could be as well. So please grab an evaluation and tell us what you think and give us ideas. I want to thank you so much for coming, but before you leave, we have some door prizes. Does everyone have a ticket? All right, if you don't, raise your hand, and Christy is going to give you one, and then we're going to give away our door prizes. Oh, I'm sorry, and Kathleen uh, will give you one, too. Any more people who need, uh, let's see, we have three over there. A couple I guess we will help.
only the people who stay to the end get the goodies. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions while we're waiting for the tickets to be dispersed? Questions? Oh, I don't know either, but give us ideas and we'll try. We'll try. This has been incredible, hasn't it? Well, it's, it's what we're all about, and we're heading in, in the right direction, as you can see. We're very excited. This is a very exciting year as we have all of these new programs. So. <laughs> Anyone else need a ticket? Okay. Well, we have some door prizes today um, that we're very pleased to give to you, and we hope that you enjoy them. <coughs> and uh, uh, there are three of them. The first one is from uh, Stories Never Sink Plant Company. It's an osteospermum. Let's see if you can remember that when you get home. There's a tag inside, I promise. And uh, it's, a, it's a cool tolerant. I wouldn't put it out at 20 degrees, but once it's over 45, it can actually take cool temperatures. Um, and in Sullivan County, I've had mine go almost until July um, in a container on my front porch. I've cut it back, and then it's rebloomed in the fall. It is an annual, but it lasts for a very long time. It's also called an African daisy. Last three numbers, 097. All right, and I just smiled at you before. Three numbers one two zero. All right, okay. So this next gift is um, from the Sullivan County Renaissance. And last but not least, from us, your friends at Sullivan Renaissance. Number one two one. walk meet outside and um, we, you will be able to take one of the plants between the two front doors on your way out the bulb plants <laughs>